In today's program, I'm going to be checking out the top 10 most popular reasons for not buying an electric vehicle instead of an internal combustion engine car. And I'll be explaining why every single one of those reasons is wrong. Who the f Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. Alter ego apparently. So the top 10 reasons for not buying an electric vehicle. Go on then. Reason number one, not enough choice. Oh, you're joking. You're not starting with that one, are you? All right, well, here's a list of all the main models available today in most markets around the world. As of July 2019, there are options in every category. Thanks to groundbreaking pioneers like Renault, Nissan and Tesla, the vast majority of major manufacturers have realised that the direction of market travel is firmly away from internal combustion engines and relentlessly towards electric vehicles. And as a result of that, there's a whole raft of brand new models in the development pipeline at all the big firms. And 2020 is the year when the industry is anticipating a tsunami of models to arrive on the market at every price point and in every category. There's even a couple of pickup trucks due soon, as well as an updated electric version of the iconic VW bus. So I really don't think lack of choice is a real issue anymore. Yeah, well, that's as maybe. But how about reason number two? Electric cars are far more expensive than internal combustion engine cars. Well, that's a fair challenge on the face of it. So let's dig into the detail a bit. As a general rule, most comparisons look at total cost of ownership, which includes not only the initial purchase price, but the cost of insurance, servicing and maintenance, and of course, mileage costs. Those costs will vary widely from country to country, but we'll have a look at Europe and North America to give ourselves an idea. And for folks who don't live in those regions, we'll put links in the description box below to cost comparison information sites in your part of the world. In February 2019, the International Council for Clean Transportation published a report comparing the cost of the VW Golf in four different engine types, battery electric, hybrid, petrol, and diesel, over four years in five different European countries, the UK, Germany, France, the Netherlands, and Norway. As this chart from The Guardian shows, in every case, the pure electric vehicle came out as the least expensive overall. Here's where you'll find the full report if you want to scrutinize the numbers, and of course, there'll be a link in the description box as well. The Canadian website Corporate Nights ran a comprehensive cost comparison exercise in April 2019 based on some pretty complicated calculations developed by Tom Lombardo, a retired professor of engineering technology and now president of Tahoka, a communication company in Rockford, Illinois. They compared a 2019 Honda Civic LX with a 2019 Nissan Leaf S and a 2019 Toyota RAV4 XLE with a 2019 Hyundai Kona Electric. Their timescale was 10 years, so that they could assume a depreciation of 100% for both types of vehicle. Once again, despite the higher initial purchase price, the electric vehicles represented better value over the full period. The ICCT also published a report for the United States in April of this year, looking forward to electric vehicle costs from 2020 to 2030. That report showed the rapidly decreasing cost of lithium ion battery packs measured in dollars per kilowatt hour. They also show how this will affect the overall cost of buying a battery electric vehicle or BEV between 2020 and 2030. And we're no longer talking about total cost of ownership here. These charts are simply showing the projected purchase prices for three size categories in the United States, a normal car, a crossover vehicle, and the SUV class. So while electric cars are already cheaper to buy and run over a five to 10 year period, by 2023, even the sticker price of a 150 mile range electric car will actually be cheaper on the car showroom forecourt than an equivalent internal combustion engine car. And even today, when the average cost of a new car in the US is $36,590, there are plenty of really great battery electric options below that price, including the best-selling Nissan Leaf and the standard Tesla Model 3. And the US Department of Energy provides this great online tool called eGallon, which lets you compare the cost per gallon of gasoline in your state with the effective cost per gallon of running an electric car. 
In every single state in 2019, electric is way cheaper. On average, recharging an electric vehicle costs about half as much per mile as a gasoline vehicle, with the biggest difference occurring in the state of Washington. In Europe, of course, we pay far more per gallon for petrol and diesel, so that per mile comparison is even more favourable towards electric vehicles over here. Curtis Moldrich, writing for Car Magazine in the UK, gave us this insight in June 2019. Let's consider a 100 kilowatt hour Tesla Model S. A typical public rapid charging point in the UK currently charges around 35 pence per kilowatt, so the cost is 100 times 35 pence, or about 35 quid if you were to theoretically charge from completely empty to completely full. Switch to a cheaper home supply, which could cost 12 pence per kilowatt hour on a good value overnight tariff, and the maths work out at a more palatable 100 times 12 pence, which is 12 quid. And that's a major saving over the cost of a 70 to 100 pound petrol diesel tank full for a typical executive car. Well, all very well and good, but we keep getting told how much better these electric vehicles are for the environment when we all know that the electricity's got to be generated somewhere so these things can charge up. So how about reason number three? Most of the electricity still comes from coal and gas, so you're still emitting CO2. Well, no, that one's not accurate either. Bloomberg ran a report in February of 2019 looking at exactly this accusation. They found that carbon dioxide emissions from battery-powered vehicles were about 40% lower than for internal combustion engines in 2018. The difference was biggest in Europe and the UK, where we have large renewable energy industries, but the comparison still held true even in China, where they're much more reliant on coal. And of course, as a consumer, you can find out who gets their electricity from renewables. For example, Ecotricity in the UK, who've got more than 300 charge points at motorway service stations up and down the country, supply 100% of their electricity from renewable sources. All Tesla superchargers are either already powered by wind and solar or in the process of being converted. And EVGo, the largest charging network in America, announced in May 2019 that it is now contracted for 100% renewable energy to power its customers. Oh, so you're apparently making it easier, cheaper and greener to buy an electric vehicle. Correct. So that leads us nicely to reason number four. If everyone buys an electric vehicle, then the electricity grid will simply collapse and then none of us will have any power for anything at all. Have you been reading the Daily Mail? There are several reasons why this is misguided information. First of all, grids in most developed nations, even today, are quite capable of handling an uplift in demand that would equate to about 15 to 20 percent of the vehicles on the road being electric. It's fairly safe to say that we're not going to experience a sudden 100% changeover from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles in the next few weeks or months. It'll take years. And in those intervening years, most countries will be accelerating the transition from fossil fuel powered grids to renewable energy powered grids. That transition will involve the rollout of smart meters that are able to tell the grid exactly how much energy each household is using at any given time. And the transition will also involve the installation of very large amounts of energy storage. And electric vehicles are basically energy storage units with a wheel on each corner. The software in electric vehicles will be able to communicate with the grid so that the grid can either send energy to the car to recharge its battery or take energy out of the car's battery to help smooth the spikes in the demand. Whoa, 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 hang on a minute, think about it. It's patently obvious that everyone's going to get home at the same time and put their vehicles on charge. So your clever grid isn't going to be able to pull any energy out of flat batteries because they're all going to need charging up. They're not kettles, you know. It won't be like half time during the match or the commercial break at the end of your favourite TV show. Most people park up for the evening and don't use the car again until the morning. So the grid can charge up vehicles at any time through the night. And if you've got any sense, you'll set up your vehicle's charging software to take advantage of cheap rate electricity after midnight. And another thing, the vehicles won't all arrive at home with a flat battery. You're really living in the wrong century if you think that's still the case. The average daily commute in the UK and the US is about 20 miles. Even the smallest EV batteries have about 100 miles of range, and most of them nowadays are actually well over 200 miles or more. So the grid will know exactly how much charge each vehicle has got left, and therefore which vehicles to draw energy from early on in the evening to smooth out the spike in demand from kettles and ovens, and which vehicles to recharge later on when electricity is cheap. So just like everything else in our modern world, it's all in the algorithm. What about when you go on a long trip then? 
Reason number five is range anxiety. Well, as I mentioned just now, only the very small cars like VW's E-Up, designed specifically for city driving, have a range as low as 100 miles nowadays. The best-selling model worldwide currently is the Nissan Leaf, and it's now got a range of 226 miles. In fact, here's the top 10. So that 226 miles only puts the Nissan Leaf at 10th place. Right up there at the top, of course, are the Tesla models. They've always been famed for their long range. It's been part of their sales pitch since inception, especially coming from out there in the wide open spaces of California. Yeah, but they all run out eventually, don't they? And reason number six is that there just isn't a big enough network of charging stations anywhere in the world to support electric vehicles yet. Let's start with America then. Here's Tesla's network of charging stations across North America. That'll get you from coast to coast and north to south with no problem at all. This is the map for EVGO, who I mentioned earlier. They're America's biggest charging network. And here's the one for Electrify America. More are coming online every week, but even back in 2018, the number of stations in the US had reached 20,000, and the total number of plug outlets was close to 60,000. Here's the UK. We've already mentioned Ecotricity. Then there's Tesla UK. And we have a great app over here called ZapMap which shows the location of every single charging point in the country. In total, as of 4th of July 2019, there are just short of 9,000 charging stations supporting more than 14,000 charging devices with over 24,000 connectors. That compares to about 8,500 petrol stations. All right, I get the idea. Get out of this one though. Reason number seven, it takes hours to charge up one of these electric vehicles, so how can that be practical? Well, that was certainly the case a few years back, and it does depend which brand you drive and how old it is. But as a general rule, a fast charger at a commercial charging station, typically rated at 50 kilowatts, will add about 150 miles of range to a compatible vehicle in about 30 minutes. Enough time for a toilet break and a cup of tea. Tesla have got their new Supercharger V3 charging stations, and they can charge Model 3 vehicles at 250 kilowatts, and Model S and Model X vehicles at 200 kilowatts. A Tesla owner recently posted a video online showing his Model 3 getting 100 miles of range in seven minutes. And Electrify America now has 120 ultra-fast charging stations at Walmart stores in 34 states in the US. Those chargers work at an eye-watering 350 kilowatts. Vehicles with batteries that can cope with this massive charging input will be on the market in the next 12 months, and they'll be charging at 20 miles per minute, which equates to 300 miles of range in 15 minutes. All right, how about reason number eight then, and a very common one in the United Kingdom. I haven't got a garage or a driveway, so how am I supposed to charge my electric vehicle at home? Well, the long-term answer is induction charging. You can already buy induction charging pads for the BMW i8, so you just drive over the top of it and it charges automatically. No plugging in, just get out of the car and walk into your home. In reality, of course, that technology is a long way off for most people, and installing one of these things outside every terraced house in Britain would certainly not be high on the priority list. But let's face it, you don't fill your car up with petrol at home, do you? So if you haven't got a garage or a driveway space, then it'll just be like an internal combustion engine car. You'll charge up when you're out. And if you drive to work, then you'll find that more and more companies will be providing charging points in their car parks, especially if they get incentivized to do that by tax allowances. Ah, but then there's reason number nine, which is that the batteries are by far the most expensive part of the car, and you'll have to replace those after two or three years because they die. Yeah, that's another good one propagated by the fossil fuel industry. But real world experience over the last decade tells a completely different story. There are Teslas and Nissan Leafs out there with 100,000 miles on the clock and still going strong with batteries at 70% capacity. In fact, it's more likely that the car itself will get scrapped long before the batteries fail. There are even schemes now to give EV batteries a second life after they've been used in the car as extra storage support for electricity grids and domestic homes. Look, I'm just gonna level with you, all right? Call it reason number 10. I know about internal combustion engine cars. I know how they work. I've been driving them for 33 years. I know what to do when they don't work. You know, I'm comfortable with them. And I don't like to change if I don't have to. And I lack the foresight and imagination to project forward into the future to see how the world's gonna work in 10 years time. And some of my mates down the pub might think I'm, you know, 
less of a man if I buy an electric car rather than a proper car with an engine in it. Well, that last point probably speaks more about their insecurities than yours. But anyway, I get it. Very few people would have predicted today's world 10 years ago. But the rapid changes we've seen in the last decade will pale into insignificance compared to what's coming in the next 10 years. It's something you're just going to need to come to terms with sooner or later. And the sooner we all come to terms with it, the quicker we'll all realise how much fun electric vehicles are to drive, how much more economical they are, and how much better they are, not just for the air quality of our towns and cities, but for the global environment as well. Plus, electric cars are rapidly becoming the coolest gadget you'll ever own, so you'll only need to show your friends a car once for them to be convinced. That's it for this week. Oi, don't push your luck. That is it for this week. Do please give us a like and a share if you found the program useful and enjoyable. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel and hit the little bell icon so you get notified when all the new programs come out each week. I've never been happier to do this bit. It's completely free to subscribe. All you need to do is click on that icon there. Oi! <laughs> As always, thanks very much for watching. And until next time, it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. goodbye.